I'm uh, Oleg Bro Larsen. I'm the founder and CEO of Falcon Social. Um, on behalf of the organizers here at Social Media Week, I need to highlight the hashtag that you can be using to uh, comment, ask questions, and blatantly bash me during the session, uh, if you feel so inclined. Uh, it's SMW Falcon. Um, the outset for this, so the idea that we had doing this, um, this session, I think it's a little bit different, uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit different compared to all of the other stuff that's happening in Social Media Week, uh, including some of the other sessions that we're doing, which is you know largely you know strategy cases and KPI marathons that you can all go through. Um, this is a little bit different. It's the story of the company um, that a couple of people uh, started to build just a few years ago um, that has really uh, gained some immense traction uh, th throughout Europe and has been an absolutely mesmerizing experience for me personally. Uh, and I'm going to share some of that stuff uh, today, some of the highlights of, of uh, where we come from and, and where we are now. My seats are at the front, sir. Um, but first, a little bit about me, because um, actually, I'm a, I have a technology background. Um, I worked at Oracle Corporation as a back-end uh, database engineer, um, and really have been a, a, a technologist turned product guy, and now I'm working in marketing primarily, working to change the way that people collaborate and communicate among, uh, with communication, basically. And that says a lot more about marketing than it says about me. Um, of course, I've, I've probably you know, changed my interest a little bit and certainly developed a lot, but um, marketing really has become a data-driven and really a, a technical expertise and a metrics-driven uh, thing as well. Uh, a thing that you apply technology to to make it work. Uh, so I worked at Oracle. Um, then after that, I spent some time in uh, NetDoctor, uh, which a lot of you Danes may know, uh, that was uh, founded just before 2000. I, I entered in uh, in 2000. And, and what you did back then, the thing I was tasked to do amongst uh, others in, in a small team, was to build the early stages of NetDoctor's communities. Uh, there was no such thing as social media back then. We called it communities, and we wanted to build you know, collaborative diaries where people could talk about depression and, and comment on each other's uh, experiences and so forth. That was the thing that we wanted to build back then. When you were to build an online community back then, there were no such thing as a Drupal. There were no Ning. Uh, there, were, there, were no real, there were no tools out there that you could use to build this. Uh, no frameworks, really. Uh, you started out by writing big checks to Oracle and Sun Microsystems to get servers. And, uh, and database licenses to even get started. And you were pretty far from having any users logging in at that point. Um, so uh, the story of NetDoctor was a classic dot com. Um, we built some amazing stuff. It was not really sustainable uh, sort of uh, financially, um, but, but we did some amazing things. The, the, the company still exists uh, um, working. Uh, it, it's owned by Berlingske today. Uh, but moving forward, um, after that, I became, so, I became so interested in, in the whole concept of, of you know, building these communities and, and uh, working with large users at scale uh, that I, together with a co-founder, uh, created a thing called Mingler.dk and .no and .se back then. So it was, uh, it was an online social network. We were hugely uh, influenced by what happened in the US with tribes.net with Friendster, and MySpace was just kicking off at that point. Uh, we, were one, we wanted to make it a little bit different. Uh, we wanted to do something that was, I think, more Scandinavian, where you could gather around in communities. So we had groups very early on that we built, um, and had a field day doing this. Um, we ended up selling the, the, the network to, um, to JLP Politikens Hus in 2007, uh, because we had a hard time monetizing on, on all the users. Um, but really, it, it, was, it, was a, it was a great experience building this up to, to 100,000 users uh, in, in the Danish market. And, and the, the Danish media industry was really interested in, 
in this type of thing because there were, Facebook was not public at the time. Uh, that happened a couple of months later. So I think the timing of us handing this off was probably pretty good. Um, but it really was, it really was the, the start of, um, of where we are today, actually, uh, building those things from scratch. What happened afterwards was that you started really seeing Facebook getting, gaining immense traction from 2007 and, and, and onwards, as soon as it grew, grew out of the educational um, uh, ecosystem. And what we did after having sold off this, um, this, uh, this social network, basically, was that we started working with agencies uh, and large media organizations in understanding how to tap into the social networks that were then evolving, uh, Facebook uh, primarily. Twitter was a ghost town, at least in, the, in Scandinavia back then. Um, but what we saw as we were building all of these viral Facebook apps for Pandora, uh, viral apps for Carlsberg and all kinds of things for the larger Danish um, uh, brands. Was that we, we started to see a, a sort of a recurring, um, a recurring issue for all of them. They had all of these users that they needed to handle. Uh, there was communication all of a sudden. And they started out by just wanting to build these campaigns and you know, get a lot of eyeballs to see their products. But suddenly people started talking back to them and how do you, how do you handle all that stuff? Uh, and that was the inception uh, of, of Falcon Social, the, the company and the product that we, that we kicked off in 2010. Uh, so that's very briefly about me, but I think that backstory is, is, is important. Um, so what's happening now? Well, basically, I mean, many of you guys have seen this conversation prison by Brian Solis before, but really what's happening now is that there are so many consumer touch points and, you know, people are talking about brands and products in uh, review threads, comment sites. Um, you can have a Spotify playlist as a brand where people can, at least very soon I hear, now talk back to that thing. So there are so many different touch points for your brand to exist in that it's becoming totally unmanageable without applying some kind of technology product or platform or process to handling all of these touch points. Um, and how are people doing that? How are people handling all these touch points today and all of the issues that they're having and listening and all, all those kind of th things. Well, they are really struggling and they're looking to uh, at basically a plethora of vendors that are trying to handle uh, a small use case uh, for, for the marketers. Um, as I also mentioned, we believe this is, mu this is obviously much more than marketing, but marketing really is the, the, uh, the, the early drivers of, of gaining, uh, of, of putting brands onto, onto social channels. And you can, you can go off and buy all kinds of things. You can have a specific tool for listening, a specific tool for engaging, a specific tool to generate your content plan, uh, and then you want analytics on top of that. What about uh, governance and who said what when on behalf of our channels? Another product, uh, basically a combination of products you can go off and do. So you end up with like 12 things to, to solve all of these, uh, all of these issues. Um, so that's one of the sort of trends that that we're um, that that we are obviously seeing and that we are sort of uh, that we are thriving uh, because of. Another related thing is that the value chain of uh, of marketing is changing a lot. Um, you have all kinds of agencies that are trying to help out. There are probably some of you here today, or at least uh, there's a lot of agencies either doing either telling that they can help out brands within social in different ways. Um, and you have the old school creative agencies haven't really come on board. Um, now you have these new social agencies and, and digital agencies trying to play their part as well. And there's a huge amount of overlap, uh, even towards the media agencies and the PR agencies. Everybody says that they can do your, their, do your content plan or, or all those kind of things. But the question is, does this really uh, belong on the agency side. At least there's a lot of overlap and a lot of fuss about who, who is supposed to be helping brands doing this. Um, and the, I love the creative agencies. Their, their sort of traditional, um, the traditional approach is to, you know, use all the budget on one big campaign, really f uh, throw off those fireworks, um, and. Um, this is actually the, uh, the, the end fireworks on the Cannes uh, Festival, uh, just to, to prove a point. Because it, really what we are seeing is that creative is not one big explosion. It's a lot of small nuggets that needs to go out. Um, 
the way you get reached traditionally is to call up the media agency. Um, the media agency will broker between you and the actual media, um, and they will uh, take a cut of that. Um, but that's not really a, a modern way of doing that either. Um, we obviously believe that uh, brands should find their moments, and then they will get the reach uh, pretty much automatically. Um, many of you know this. Uh, many of you know this uh, Oreo example during the Super Bowl. Um, not going to uh, spend too much time on that. There's another one that I really like. Um, is uh, this tweet from Adidas during the Wimbledon? Uh, this was the most retweeted uh, tweet during the Wimbledon. It got an immense amount of reach. Uh, so it's just when Murray wins the Wimbledon, uh, Adidas tweets this at this uh, basically when he wins. Obviously, this is they have the copy ready, everything's prepared. But what's super interesting about this is that it's a piece of social content. It's the most engaged with during the Wimbledon, but in fact, it's a piece of advertising. It's clearly Adidas having all this thing, all this uh, prepared and, and sending it out at the right time. So things are becoming adaptive and real time, and the existing agency value chain are having a really hard time doing that effectively. Um, at least in the current incarnation. I'm sure there was a, an agency involved in doing this, though. Uh, so, so it's kind of happening, but you would need a much faster uh, approval flow uh, with, with, the, with the brand managers and the, and, uh, and the CMOs of, of the businesses. So all of this is leaving us in an interesting uh, interesting situation as, as brand managers and community managers because we want to listen to what's happening out there. If it's terrible or wonderful, uh, we probably want to engage with that. Um, and even though we're listening and engaging, we also have this uh, urge to put out our own content plan and, um, and, and do analytics on top of all of that. So we, we really need all of these things um, in one unified suite is our approach. So. What I'm telling you now is the, the sort of initial strategy of what we saw early on that we, that we wanted to build. Um, we wanted to build a unified suite that didn't do just one of these things. Not only listen, uh, but also engaged, also have engagement capabilities built in, strong content planning and analytics and governance on top. Um, and the road to go there, um, is, uh, is, a pretty, is actually a pretty short one. So um, I said that we founded the company in, in 2010, and um, we were pretty much under the radar for at least a year and a half, where the two guys, you can barely see there on the slide, were, were really, really busy together with me building the, the early stages of the product. Um, what happened? really early was that we got a lot of interest from the clients we were already working with on the agency side, such as Pandora and Carlsberg. Uh, they really saw that the vision and the early stages of the product that we have was very, very compelling to them. Um, so we basically, before the product was, well, when it, when it was only in pilot phase, we got a lot of high profile customers to test this with. So it was not, it was not sort of a desk research job. This, this was probably good. Uh, people will probably need this stuff. We had actual customers with real pain points that we were solving. Um, so this is um, April 2012. We, 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 were just, we were just three people in the company. Um, we, had, we had our pilot product with, uh, with sort of the early stages of all of these modules in there. And we had, we had customers that were really excited about it. But it was two, product, uh, two developers and, and me, the product guy, uh, trying to roll this out. So it was absolutely clear that we needed to scale this very quickly because we saw we had a product that was really compelling. Uh, we needed to build a sales team. We needed to build stronger marketing. We needed to build a much stronger customer service team. At this point, we had, um, we had some part-timers that were really savvy with social and understood this very quickly, that we're doing our, our, our customer support together with me and these guys. Uh, so it was total garage stuff at, at this point. Um, so I went off to, to basically gain some venture capital funding for the, for the business. 
Um, so I went on a, a seed funding tour. I went to, first, first of all, I went around Copenhagen to all the big venture capitalists. Um, actually, I have one question before I go forward, just to make sure what kind of audience we have. Are any of you guys entrepreneurs at the moment, building companies? Great. Have any of you guys looked at or considered attracting venture capital funding? Okay, great. Um, so what I started out doing was to sort of do the rounds here locally. And um, we have some pretty good funds. We, have, we also have the, the government organization, Vext Fund, that has uh, piles of cash that you can tap into uh, if, if, you, if you do it right. Um, but because we had, we, had a very, we had a very compelling product at the stage, and we had customers that were really excited about it when, when uh, we, got, we had really nice references, it was almost too easy for us. So this, this sounds a little cocky, and, uh, but it was very easy for us to gain the first term sheets uh, the first offers to, to, for people to invest in us in Copenhagen. Actually, it was so easy that, I, that we thought, okay, this, this, this is, doesn't feel right. We probably need to go to London. We probably need to go to the US. If they're so interested back home, can we get a better deal? Um, at least we needed to benchmark and see that the deals we were, we were seeing back home were good. So I went to London um, and saw a couple of funds over there. Um, I went to... Uh, Sand Hill Road in, in, um, in Silicon Valley. And so the overall, the overall perception of that was, that was that, first of all, the numbers over there were just so much bigger. And we were, we were still too small for, this, for, these, uh, uh, for, for the funds that I talked to over there. At least we had to move everybody to the US at, the, at that time. That was not really practical for us. It wasn't doable. Um, so what I did was we, we came home. Uh, and, and, um, and, and sort of did a second round of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, talks with, with Danish VCs. But what, what also happened at the time, uh, that was, was really fortunate timing for us, was that um, we were invited to, um, to Facebook for their first uh, uh, preferred marketing developer conference when they came up with the PMD program, which is essentially a partnership program for for, for technology vendors, uh, we got uh, three out of four badges in that program, which basically put us in the top 10 of, uh, of, all, uh, of all partners at the time. Um, so that really created a huge momentum for, for us meeting analysts and, and meeting VCs just after that. So that was the same trip to, to Silicon Valley where, where, where this happened. Um, so I got to meet uh, the Altimeter group uh, with uh, Jeremiah Oweyang that some of you guys may, may know. And, and he got really excited about the product as well because we got this endorsement from, from, from Facebook. So we saw a lot of, um, a lot of buzz, a lot of traction, I guess, uh, for the product and for the company very quickly after that. Um, so I came home and basically ended up doing a deal with uh, a Danish uh, fund called Northcap Partners. And what we did then was that we raised uh, 8 million Danish kroner, approximately 1 million euros. Um, and it just seemed like a gazillion at the time. I mean, what couldn't we build with, this, uh, with, with, with these 8 million? Um, so, but, but the first thing that was really important to go off and do was to really build a customer acquisition team, a sales team, that could scale the company uh, and scale the customer base very quickly. Um, so at this point, um, having all of these accolades from, from Facebook and, and raising this capital, uh, this was still the case. This was the entire team and a couple of part-timers in June 2012. Um, what we did very quickly then was to, together with these partner, with the, uh, the partner from, uh, from the VC who, who actually were really, really helpful in scaling the sales part of the organization. So we got our first uh, head of sales in. Uh, built the customer service team. Um, all of this happening in, in June, uh, June, July in 2012. Um, and we started um, the first sales that wasn't me going out into conference room and showing the product myself started to happen. So that was a huge pivotal moment for me, seeing that somebody else could actually take this baby of mine and go sell it uh, very effectively. Um, so that was, that was the things that were happening in, in uh, 
in, in, in the third and fourth quarter of, of 2012, early after uh, receiving the funding. Um, we started getting a lot of, uh, sort of a lot of events and a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, awards and stuff that we were winning, uh, especially in the venture scene, because the, the metrics and the way we were growing were very impressive. Uh, so there's the Nordic Venture Forum and, and the European Venture Summit in Berlin. Um, so there were four categories at the European Venture Summit, and, uh, and these are the four winners. There's one guy missing, uh, that's me, because I was out selling uh, th this product to, to a large, uh, fast-moving consumer goods organization at the time. Um, and, and I think there's a very, there's a very important point in, in, um, in this. So if, you're, if you, you guys who are working with your startups, I'm sure you go to a lot of events and... And, um, and, and those, are, those are really nice, there's some nice talks and, and, um, and, and you, get a meet, you get to meet a lot of interesting people. But what you really need to do to get ahead with your company is not to go to all kinds of events all the time. You need to get back home, build product and, and sell it. That's what you need to do. It's super important not to end up in the, uh, the classic sort of startup ecosystem. I almost think there's like a singularity of incubators and stuff happening that is almost deterring people from doing what they actually should be doing. Um, so to, to sort of solidify what we, what we did at the time, uh, I'm going to show you some, some graphs. Some people have said that, wow, you're going to show those graphs. Yes, I am going to show these graphs. Um, one, of the, one of the things that was pivotal for us after, after gaining the funding was, um, was what was happening in, in Q3 and Q4. So this is where we started building our sales team. In, uh, in the third quarter of, of 2012. Uh, the blue um, segment is the Danish customer base, or the, the, the additional customers coming in in that quarter. And you can see, as soon as we started adding the, the sales team, where we specifically went for people that had, so we had a, we had a German guy, we had uh, a guy from the UK, uh, we had one Dane, the manager, and uh, we had a guy from Austria, we had a guy from Portugal. Um, so really trying not to get any Danes on board because there's a lot of Danish traction al already. Um, so it's really important to find somebody that by second nature would not necessarily start calling the C20 companies of Denmark because we were already pretty good, uh, we're in pretty good uh, uh, going concern with those guys. So what happened already in Q4 was that we saw the international customer base growing quicker than the Danish ones for a company that was so, so early stage. So that is very, very unusual. And what I said to the board of directors, which was me and the, and the VC uh, that came in and a second guy we, we got on board, was that, okay, this is the biggest validation point we can get that this product is relevant outside of Denmark. It, it, it's there, it's, they've signed the contracts and they've sent us money. It, it's the biggest, uh, sort of uh, approval point that we can get. So what I, what I said to them was that, okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to scale this company as fast as I possibly can with the cash that I have. Um, so we just, we, what we went off and did was that we, uh, just after New Year in 13, we uh, hired the, sort of our head of marketing, the first... Um, the first sort of seed of a marketing team, we scaled up sales even further and really did everything we could to make sure that the next two quarters would be absolutely mesmerizing in terms of traction. Um, and, and that sounds pretty easy, but yeah, of course you want to scale fast, but you only have so much cash to do so. So it's a really, it's a balancing act. Uh, you want to, because we already decided to become a venture backed company. If you raise venture capital, you don't have it lying around on the shelf for a rainy day. That's absolutely stupid. You need to spend it, this sounds a little bit wrong, but you need to spend it as fast as you possibly can without failing. Um, and that's exactly what we did. So another thing, another important graph to show that, that really shows the, um, the traction that we did. So the, I apologize, there are no absolute numbers out there because I can't disclose that. But, what we did in the first half of 2013, which was exactly the period I'm talking about, so we 
six months before we went into uh, to this period, we had raised the capital, uh, New Year's, uh, talked to the board and say, okay, now we're going to scale as fast as we can in the next two quarters. Uh, what we did was that we tripled uh, the monthly recurring revenue uh, during the first part of the first half of 2013. Um, that is a very, very impressive feat also, because we, we, we had an okay level of, of monthly recurring revenue at the time. Um, a little note, if you're a software as a service company, as we are, we basically sell subscriptions to a platform. The only metric, or the most important one, there are a few, there are a few more, but the most important one is how you're doing uh, with MRR. How are you ramping up your monthly recurring revenue? And tripling it in six months is very impressive. Um, but there's a flip side to all of this wonderful up and to the right uh, uh, graphing. Um, that's the graph I'm going to show you now. It also has the actual figures on it. Um, I showed this graph to the team um, in the summer of uh, 13. And that's the cash balance of the company as we go through this scaling. Um, you can see we raised exactly eight million, um, and it, it looks like we spend the same amount of cash every month. That's not the case because we had a lot of revenue coming in. You can't see the input and output. You can just see what the balance is. So we scaled the team immensely in the second half, but we also got a lot of revenue. So it was really balancing that very quickly and, and gaining this this uh, this immense traction. Um, what that enables us to do was to raise our Series A in a market where everybody's talking about a Series A crunch. A lot of people can get seed capital, but not a lot of people can raise their Series A at a, at a probable level or at a level that are, that are good terms for founders. Um, but the, guys, the, one of, the ones of you who knows our story knows that we, we raised a 6 million euro Series A uh, in August, um, taking us to this level with a very nice box of Legos to, to play with and go off and, and build the company. And we did that at very impressive terms in terms of dilution and all that stuff. But as you can see, it was not, it was not entirely without risk. And we, we, had, we had some other options if we weren't able to raise the round. But really scaling as fast as you can with the capital that you have and doing this is, uh, is something that we're incredibly fortunate to have been able to do. Um, and it really is, it's, it's, it's so much a collective effort uh, if sales hadn't sold the stuff they did, uh, if we didn't ha haven't, hadn't built the product, they wouldn't be able to, to sell it because basically the way that they sold the product was to show it in online demos. Uh, so we've done something that were very impressive on the product side, had great salespeople, and the finance team that helped me out in, in, in attracting the round also excelled. So um, that's kind of what everything needs to work together to do this. Um, so overall, in, in uh, 2013, we, we did a 600% growth on this monthly recurring revenue metric, which is also um, very unusual. Um, but I think one of the most sort of substantial ways of understanding growth is the amount of people that's now at the office. So we went from the three, the three persons you, you saw there on the first slide and we're now 100 and, actually I think this is not up to date, we're 105, 80-ish is the latest uh, number I hear. Um, so we, we went from, five, from, from three to over 100 in 18 months. Um, what we've done here, this, this sounds so crazy that it needs some explanation. Um, we've scaled up the service team considerably. Um, We've scaled up sales to be even more uh, thorough in, in, in terms of, so both in terms of languages uh, on the sales and the service side, we've really scaled up a lot uh, because uh, a lot of our customers are not from Denmark. So we need, to, we need to have both sales and service and account people who speak uh, German, who speak French, uh, who speak the Scandinavian languages uh, fluently, even though no Swedes love to speak English. It's even better if you have somebody who, who knows the local language. So th that's part of why we, we wanted to scale this up so quickly. Um, we have a marketing team uh, that is uh, much, more much more complete now. Um, and one of the things that we've identified uh, that we were able to do in, here in Copenhagen is 
that we are now at 31 nationalities across the entire team. Um, you, sometimes you hear a lot about Copenhagen and Denmark not being good for sort of being a little sort of self-centered or closed around ourselves, but that's actually not what what we're seeing. We're seeing um, a lot of people from across the globe wanting to come to Copenhagen and uh, specifically work for us, which we're really happy about, obviously. But it's it's also the city that attracts. Um, so what we've done in all of our messaging now, even when we look to the U.S., is that we we um, we've kind of taken uh, we, we don't use Denmark as much. We use Copenhagen more, um, at least, uh, and, and that that's worked really well. Let's hope they don't do a lot of fuds out in the zoo more, because then we then we'll, we may be having some issues. Um, but but really really taking Copenhagen as a, as a thing for for. Um, for design, uh, for uh, for understanding uh, data privacy and all those kind of things is the thing that's that's working very well for us. Um, we've been fortunate to attract a lot of uh, really marquee brands. Uh, all of these are working with us in multiple regions or, or globally. Um, as you can see, there, there's a big spread here, both in terms of verticals with the travel industry, luxury, fast-moving consumer goods. There's also a big spread in terms of countries. Uh, we have Emirates out of the, out of the Middle East and Dubai. A um, uh, lot of German clients, uh, Dutch, Swiss, and so forth. Um, we've also been fortunate to attract a lot of uh, partnerships and, and accolades. Um, and I also think this. I, I talked about not going to all of these events previously, and you really have to pick the right ones if you're because as a as an entrepreneur, there are two things you're really strapped for: it's cash and time. Um, so building all of these, the, these are so of course we 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 build a great product, and we we liaised a lot with Facebook to get the PMD badge. Um, we also worked a lot with Google to get uh, a Google Plus Pages partnership. We were the first one is in Europe. Um, we've liaised with Sendesk a lot to become a partner with them. Um, and then there were all of these uh, venture, uh, venture awards and ceremonies that we participated in. And it's, it's always really difficult when you go to these things to understand whether or not you're going to get uh, ROI out, out of the time that you're going to be spending. And, and the amount of time I've spent doing all of this stuff is, is just staggering. But they kind of build upon each other. That, uh, first we won the Nordic Venture Forum, then we got through the European Venture Summit, uh, Red Herring and White Bull, and all those things led up to us. Uh, I'm sure it has some merit in, in making us able to, to do the A round. Um, one thing I want to highlight also in what we've done is that we have scaled up our uh, R&D staff, our engineers, um, considerably. Um, so we have 27 engineers. Um, they're not in Ukraine. They're not in India. They're in Kermagel, and they're ready to rock. They are absolutely creating, uh, you know, some absolute staggering uh, feature depth charges that we're going to deploy into the market um, really soon. Um, and that's, I also think that's a little bit unusual that you build a very large engineering team in what is perceived as a high cost um, high-cost environment. Um, but because this space that we're in, social media and, and digital advertising, is moving so fast, um, we've decided to do that. And that's, uh, that's really paying off. Um, just very quickly on, on what it is that these engineers are building. As I said previously, we believe that all of these use cases, listening, engaging, creating your own content plan and publishing, uh, measuring and managing and setting up governance models and permissions and, and analytics on top of it. All of that needs to happen in one unified platform. You don't want to go off and have Radiant 6 or Meltwater. Uh, then you add Hootsuite for, uh, for, uh, for community management. Uh, maybe you go and shell out for Percolate out of New York City to create a great content plan. Um, social bakers for analytics. Uh, maybe hearsay social to create some kind of governance on top of this. It doesn't even really work to use all of these things. Uh, you need to have one unified platform to do that. And that's, that's what we're aiming to build. Um, so we have these uh, collaborative overviews. 
Um, we basically see what has the team been doing previously, um, what should I be doing. Um, it's both in terms of outbound content planning or responding to things that are coming in. All of this is in one unified interface. Um, so the, again, monitoring, um, be able to set up monitoring listening projects uh, separately so you can create something for yourself. Uh, maybe you have a specific thing you want to listen to. Maybe you have, uh, maybe you want to listen for, to, to all your competitors. You can create those, these separate listening projects uh, and assign permissions and, and, um, and, and tasks to your team members to do this. But when you've listened, uh, you want to engage. You want to really um, really want to, you know, to, to respond to things that are happening, and, and we do that very well. As, uh, um, and again, as soon as you're in these, in these networks, um, there's an expectation that you put out your own great content as well. And it's, I mean, it's also a big theme uh, at this entire Social Media Week, um, what content to put out, and how do we do that? Where do we source it from? Um, and you have to put out content every day, multiple times a day, if you want to be the most effective. So how do you do that? Where do you source it from? How do you make sure that, that, it is, uh, that you plan it correctly? Um, one of the ways that, that our clients are doing it, um, uh, this is the Carlsberg content plan, at least parts of it, for a week. Um, and you can see that a lot of stuff came out um, early, uh, sort of Monday and Tuesday, stuff that has been published. You can easily see you know, what's going out in the uh, what's going out next or in the, the remainder of the week. Um, so this is really sort of a drill down from from content managers and um, and and brand managers to see. What we what we strive to do also is to um, to do real time analytics on top of the content as it goes out. Um, so this is one example where we go in and look specifically at how many eyeballs are seeing this post right now in the newsfeed. Uh, you also see how, how many of it are seeing it because it has paid amplification on it. Um, you can see here in this example that uh, the blue, the organic reach, has died very quickly. Um, and somebody punched the amplification button to, get, to give it a sort of a more, uh, a longer lease on life. Um, the capability to you know, create these, uh, these quick touch points, uh, apps or sweepstakes or whatever you want to call it, and send it out also on mobile. Um, analytics on top of all of this stuff. Uh, and one of the specific things that the engineering team is working on right now that we're launching in this quarter is doing custom social reporting, basically. So what we've, what we've identified when we talk to all of our clients is that there is uh, really no one-size-fits-all in terms of analytics reporting. When we go to somebody and say, okay, so how would the ideal report for you guys look? Um, so we got 250 different answers, basically. Um, so what we've done is, is to go off and create something where you completely customize your reports out of a very vast directory of metrics from all the social channels uh, that you have attached to the platform. Um, so and we, we have a really bold view of how this will end up, and, and we don't really know exactly where, where things are going. We're, we're working uh, specifically with the marketing and the customer service use case to a very large extent right now. Um, but we really do believe that this is becoming uh, sort of much broader in the enterprise, the, the social business um, concept that everybody's talking about. Um, so the capability to do, to set up your organization in a, um, in a, in a way where you have administrators, content creators, and, uh, and so forth in a, in a great way. Um, a final thing that I want to show that we've, uh, that we've done is, um, is an example out from, from Carlsberg. Um, so you saw their content plan, where you saw sort of the atomic level of all the content that they're doing. And they have some reports and all of this sort of on a micro level that they can see. What we've also done is a, an overall 70-inch uh, dashboard that hangs in multiple places out there in, in Valby, um, where they can see you know, right now, how much engagement are the different brands and the different teams getting? You can see it's visualized and animated. Sorry about the handheld uh, uh, iPhone action here, but, but you really can see the way that, that these sort of classic social metrics are being visualized 
And um, one of the interesting things is that since this is wall mounted on a, on a wall out there in, in Carlsberg, uh, it becomes much more relevant to everybody that walks by. It's not a Google Analytics login they have to check in on. It's not a PDF attachment they have to open. Um, it really is the, the metrics from the social team or the content team being right there uh, on the wall. Um, and that has some interesting repercussions, uh, such as uh, this wonderful anecdote that I like to tell, which is uh, that the CEO of Carlsberg Group globally, uh, Jörn Buhl, he walked into the marketing team one day and said, why do we only have an engagement level of 80 this week when it was 120 last week? I mean, you, you, you just don't get normally a CEO being at all interested in any social metrics. Let's just say it as it is. It really, it, we're really not there yet. But taking these metrics and making them uh, sort of consumable and, and making, them, making them visible on the wall is, uh, is a thing that, uh, that sort of doing this, this sort of large scale custom work on top of what we're doing it also shows a little bit about how we see the space and how we want to, uh, how we want to proceed. Um, enough product uh, talk. Um, but what we have seen so far is that we've really become strong in, in Europe in terms of rollout. And we, we're super fortunate and, and happy to, to, have, uh, to have been, uh, to see all the traction that we're getting. Um, the next step for us is a very focused entry into the United States. Um, one of the things that, that, we, that we're seeing is that even though the United States is a, I mean, the, the expectations as to how big your company should be, your, your capital structure, your, uh, your service team, I mean, one of the reasons why we're scaling up so fast is we want, we want to be ready for the expectations over there. Um, so that's, that's what we're working to do uh, here in the, in the first part of, of 2014. Um, and that's pretty much where we are as, as a company. So I kind of touched on a part, upon some of, the, some of the interesting aspects of, of the journey so far. Um, going to the US is going to be uh, quite interesting. Uh, of course, we, we're not leaving Europe behind. We have a very strong uh, team and operation, a lot of clients here. So it's going to be interesting to do those things in parallel, adding that extra uh, uh, beachhead and that extra operation to uh, to the company, uh, that's a thing we're really excited to be doing. Yes, that's a question. Who are your biggest competitors in the last week? Yeah, so, so for the stream, uh, the question was, who uh, are the biggest competitors in the US? Um, so interestingly enough, the biggest competitors in the US are largely the same ones that are the biggest competitors here especially in the segment that we're looking at. Uh, so Sprout Social uh, is a nice, capable uh, entry-level tool, in our opinion. Um, it has some cool features, and it's certainly useful for a lot of use cases, and sometimes you don't need more than that. Uh, but that's not the guys we compare ourselves to. Uh, we compare ourselves much more to um, uh, somebody like Sprinkler, uh, Spreadfast, um, to, and to Hootsuite Enterprise. I think Hootsuite has this interesting um, quasi approach where they want to be really low end and are trying to be really high end as well. I think they're struggling being able to do that. Um, we want to be, I mean, have a really, really nice and usable interface really going along with the consumerization of enterprise products uh, because people want to use something that's easy and, and, and a pleasure to use, even though it's enterprise strength and has governance, it needs to be nice and, and, and easy to use. Uh, but we're not going for the low end. Uh, we're going for the high end, rather. Yeah? Any more questions? Yeah, go ahead. What have been like your primary driver for the, for the marketing? Have it been like content marketing, paid, tailor marketing, classic offline, or? That's a good question. Um, so our, our current strategy right now is very different from how we started out at the, sort of at the bottom of all of these curves that I showed you. Um, we had zero marketing spend 
when we started out. Um, so this was very much, was much more outbound than it was inbound, you could say. So we had a sales team that specifically went for the people that we believed should be really interesting in what we had to offer. And we diligently uh, and courteously uh, insisted on showing them what we had. Um, and and that, that's still part of the strategy, um, because we, we believe so strongly in the product that if we get to show it, we get a lot of uh, uh, smiling faces. Um, but in terms of marketing right now, we are, we are all about content marketing. We're all about content marketing and inbound, and uh, marketing automation and all those, all those things. Um, a lot of our marketing team is here today, so you can, uh, you can ask them for more insights on, on how we're doing this. But of, of course, yeah, content marketing is, uh, is a key, uh, key thing for us. How do you recruit people when you have to go from three to 103 people and yeah. to Copenhagen in three months? So how do we recruit uh, 100 people in 18 months across 31 nationalities in Copenhagen? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, it seemed like they... So first of all, LinkedIn is your friend if you want to recruit. Um, it really is. We have not... We have done a little bit of... We have used a few recruiters, but it's actually only in the end here. I don't know why. Maybe we've got... Um, Maybe we, maybe we should, I should sort of decree not to use recruiters anymore because you can actually really, if you have something that's very interesting and very compelling to come work for, you can attract a lot of interesting people actually, uh, so it seems. So you market your product or you market your employees? How do you make yourself interesting to the newcomers? So I think us as a company is being, we try to convey the story um, also on our website in a compelling way so that it is, when we, when we set out a, a job application or job post on, on LinkedIn and link that to our website, it seems very compelling and, uh, and, and that's part of, of why I think we, we get all the candidates that, that we do. Um, but really, we haven't done any, haven't done that much magic. I think we've worked a lot with our network, especially in, in R&D. Um, so gaining the best uh, web developers and, and engineers I mean, we've been, we've been fortunate to have a lot of them you know, quit their current jobs and come to us and, and really ask for it. It sounds like it's an amazing journey you're on, I, I want to join in. So we've, we've been fortunate to attract a lot of great engineers and a lot of uh, uh, really good salespeople. So have, may I ask one more question? Of course you may. Um, usually that's the way all people, all tech companies start because they have a network and they use the resources in the networks. Mm. That works as long as you're new and upcoming and exciting. Yeah. But very soon you're going to be a brand, a certain brand. So how do you keep that vibe? Or how do you plan to recruit when you reach that level and you're not that upcoming and you'd yeah. like to take that journey with you anymore? Do you so, get my... I totally get it, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so how do we keep this being interesting yeah. in the three-digit headcount uh, arena? Yeah. Um, so. One of the wonderful things is that if you come to our Friday bar, it seems like we're still 15 people, even though there is, it's been scaled up times six. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. Um, so I think um, I th part of that is, I think the dynamics of having 31 different nationalities, um, all of them being fairly young and really driven towards what we're doing is part of why we haven't uh, you know, seen morale or seen the excitement collapse. That's the thing that worries me a lot, actually, that, that very subject. Um, so how do we stay exciting? Well, we better. Obviously, we die. And, it, we, it, and, and I think part of it what is consistently building the, you know, the story and the journey that we're on. If, if we went off and say, hey, we have a great product now, let's, uh, let's sit back and uh, let's you know, ramp up uh, marketing spend and just you know, milk this cow. Or whatever. There are so many ways you, you, could, you could look at this. Then it would not be exciting for anybody. Uh, least of all me. Um, that's, I hope that answers. Uh, yeah. uh, Rudwan Suleiman, please ask for the mic because it's televised for the social media week. Uh, I have questions. Do you have uh, invasion team? Because you ask, uh, you say you have a future plan to enter in the U.S. market. This is the first question. Do you have invasion team? Do you have uh, culture understanding to the new market? This is the second question. The third question, U.S. is big. Which, which state? So the f I didn't understand the first uh, question. What was that again? Do I have what team? 
is doing outbound prospecting in nine minutes uh, synced with the East Coast time zone. Um, so we already now have a lot of uh, activity in terms of gaining the first steps of attracting US customers, and we have a few on board already. So the approach to, um, to attract customers by showing the product because we believe that it is so compelling is already working for us remotely in the US. It's not the best way of doing it, but it's our current way of gathering the first data points. Um, so that is the invasion team or the air cover, the, 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 the air raid that's happening right now. Um, I forgot if there was a third question I didn't answer. What was that? Oh yeah, that's, thank you. Um, so we want to be on the East Coast because of time zone issues with the Copenhagen operation. Um, it's if you're in the Silicon Valley or on the or in California and you try to you know, talk to somebody a co-worker in Copenhagen that's really terrible I mean it, it, it has to be uncomfortable for either of the uh, of the of the people wanting to talk together so be, simply because of the time zone issue being so big we want to be on the East Coast um, so that's the answer Yeah, so my question is about, it's a, I think it's a little bit before, is how did you get out of Copenhagen? Like, where, like why did you choose to go Scandinavia and south? And um, what, was, what happened in that decision-making process? So first of all, we, we, wanted, we created a product that, you know, so we created a product that was really high-end early on. It, we, we wanted it to be relevant to, to larger organizations. Um, so, it was part of the strategy that we were very quickly run out of uh, you know, um, companies in, in, in Copenhagen that, uh, that we could talk to. And, and another thing was that we, we saw sort of the big US companies starting to make uh, acquisitions to a large extent and, and wanting to move into this space as well. So we, we foresee that if we, if we chose to just stay in Copenhagen, we would be run over by big American behemoths very quickly. Um, so we needed to at least expand out in Europe and have a strong presence across the, the different cultures in, in Europe. And I think there was a, a, a question on, on culture as well. Uh, I think that the fact that we're able to uh, talk to, to, to sell and service to, to Germans and Swedes, Norwegians and guys in the UK, that's much more difficult as an organization to pull off than it is to sell to somebody in New York City. Um, so, so I think that the, the, uh, the, the idea of, of uh, having to be broad and understanding multi, multi, uh, multiple cultures and, um, and really also building that into the product is, a, is an important thing. Um, so partly because uh, we were f well, pretty sure that the Americans would come to us, so we better not stay uh, at the home base, basically. Yeah, in your, uh, when you sextupled uh, your MMR in six months, uh, can you give us an idea as to what the use case was for making that happen? Uh, can you identify that it was a focus on a specific region, or were you uh, going after a use case, or was it because you had salespeople in? But could you elaborate uh, a bit more explicitly on, on uh, the case of, of, uh, of that uh, in terms of uh, customer acquisition? Yeah, so... Um, the, the 6x on MRR was throughout the entire uh, year of 13, just to, to make that clear. Um, and it was not, so, so that was selling our product. We don't sell a lot of different things. We have this one platform that we love and that we nurture, and, and that's what we sell. So it was 6x MRR on that. 
Um, we don't have a big service revenue, services included, when you come on board with us. Um, but to, make, to add some more points to it, is even though we say it, it proliferates throughout the enterprise and it's not just marketing, um, a lot of that is marketing budgets. It's still the marketing team that leads the decision, in most cases, to buy a platform like ours. And then it progresses from there. Um, so it's marketers having huge pain looking at that terrible slide I opened with and, and are wanting to go to my third slide, which is where the whole thing is nicely uh, condensed and, uh, and, and where the overview is. So, so the, yeah, the, the revenue uh, growth is uh, a simple SaaS revenue uh, that rec recurs every month. Yep, we got three more minutes for questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, did you actually, did you use a study or work in the US? Because your approach to your business seems really American actually, and I love it. Did you used to work there? No, I did not. Okay. Um, I've, yeah, I've, I've heard that before. Um, I, I don't know, I mean, it's just, it, for us it became, it's also, because it seems almost frantic to just go off and scale this quickly. And, and there was also a sense of urgency in the fact that if we don't do this, um, you know, Adobe is going to buy up all the US players and come here. That's actually what they've tried to do. Adobe has you know, their marketing cloud, Adobe Social, and, and it's a huge, uh, uh, we call it a franken suite, because they've just bought off all kinds of different things and piled them together with the idea that that is now a coherent a platform to work with. It is certainly not, and their clients know, Gartner and Forrester, the analysts also re re realized that that's the case. But we were, we were pretty much pretty afraid of what would happen if we didn't move quickly. We needed to get to this stage because now Gartner and Forrester is starting to cover, cover us. If we were a small time player, it wouldn't have happened, and our window of opportunity would have been gone. Um, so it was a sense of urgency and fear also that that can be good. Deadlines, fear, that can be useful in, 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 in certain, uh, certain occasions. Any plan to enter uh, the Middle East market? Because you have one sponsor, Amarat Airlines. Um, yeah, so, so we have a few clients in, uh, in the Middle East, actually. And we don't have a focused approach. We have uh, some local partners that are, that are working down there. Um, uh, Emirates we did directly, so not via partners. We, we have very little sort of partner channel activity right now. But, um, so we don't have a focused approach to, to the Middle East, but we do cover um, Arabic language and, uh, and all those kind of things. Um, what kind of conditions comes with, uh, with uh, funding from investors, typically? Depends on how much they want you. Um, so our seed, run was, seed f uh, round was completely without structure. Structure is things that you don't want in your term sheets. Um, because it was very compelling and we were pretty cocky and I flew around and all that. Um, but it, it's really, well, there's a book I recommend you to read if you're going through this process, but um, it really is an open field of negotiation. It's a chess game and you have to be pretty switched on to make sure you don't end up with something that's, that's not very interesting. But um, it really is, if you have something that's very attractive and you have multiple investors being interested, then you end up in, in a nice place. Um, but for instance, if, when we did all of that wonderful scaling, we're also running out of cash, so there was a nice, uh, there was a nice deadline going on in terms of making sure that we, we, we raised the capital to, to get, go to the next level. We had some other options, so it would, we wouldn't have failed if we didn't do it. But if, if, for instance, if you go through that, uh, the, the, you, you, you scale up the company by spending the cash you have very quickly, and you don't get the next round in, and you ask your existing investors to come help you, then they will, you will pay a big price for that, usually. Um, so you really have to 
we're going to have to make sure that you have something very compelling to offer and have multiple options whenever you go through this to, to, get, the, um, to get to the best uh, place. So really what I'm, my answer is a non-answer because there's so many variants of, of this. Um, but usually they will, you know, they will, they will, the process is that they will go off and, and, and value your company at a certain level and then you will say, well, I need a million euros and so you better be worth more than that. Um, and then they will take that cut of the company as you go in there. If, if they're especially worried and you're not very interesting, then they will add other types of structure on top such as if we sell, we need our million out first, and then also the ratio and all kinds of terrible things that they will, uh, so-called liquidation preference, that they will add in. Um, but it's all about having something very compelling. And if you just go off with an idea and a PowerPoint and don't, uh, that's the first step. You have an idea, then you go off and get raised funding. I really don't recommend that. Um, uh, then you can go off and build a product, or at least the early stages of a product, that's better. Um, it's much better to have a product and customers when you go to them. Then they will be very interested. Um, especially if the customers are saying, and when they do the reference calls, that yes, this is wonderful. Uh, we want more of this. Um, then, you, then you get to the best, uh, the best terms. Recommend a book? Yes. Um, so if you're, so this is very sort of technical uh, venture uh, terms, uh, a book called Venture Deals. You search that on Amazon. Um, I, I read that the night before the, the A round negotiation, and it and it was really really good. Uh, it just it, it it's basically a chess game of with some options that are recurring, and they they play that game. And if you're ready for that game, then you're in a better position. That I think we've gone over. Cheers. Thank you, guys. <laughs>